uh, but of course if you never get to those meetings. Uh, we really have had today some of the top top people in their field. Um, <laughs> Mr. Lord Peterson is the top, top, top of this field. He is a model maker, a special effects guru, uh, part, really part of the real core of ILM. Uh, he's been part of the Star Wars world since... Uh, 1975. 1975. So, uh, when you see things like the X-Wing, the Death Star, an Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, the Mind Parts sequence, every, really everything you can think of, uh, this man had a part of that. So we're very lucky enough to have him. He's going to do a presentation and then maybe take some questions. So I turn it over to Mr. Lord Peterson.
park. They would have parks. So they had like a hamburger, would have swings, uh, that would just slide and come out of gigantic hamburgers, mouth or off the lettuce. And uh, so I was asked to carve those things originally, not to actually manufacture them, but just to carve them originally. You know, first starting out with a chainsaw, you know, and then and then getting with a knife and sandpaper. And just happened to be on a big a studio where I, uh, we had a big, uh, big area to work. Uh, I came nose to nose walking down the street on the studio set, and it was one of the guys that I went to college with. And he said, uh, you know, we're working on a science fiction film out in the valley, and we're having a really hard time finding model makers, and you'd be perfect. Would you, would you consider? And I was like, well, I got my own little company now. Um, I don't know, maybe I'll come out and see what you're doing. And at the time, the word science fiction didn't you know, make me think, wow, you know, what a chance. Uh, the previous year, um, the film was out, it's called Silent Running, and uh, I, oh, I thought it was going to be the honor, you know, and, uh, and nobody ever checks out Silent Running uh, to see. Not Silent Running, it was Logan's Run, I'm sorry, I had a bad mouth, but uh, Silent Running was actually kind of neat. Logan's run had a lot of the girls in scrimpy outfits running uh, various places. Guys <laughs> and um, anyway, I, I went out and uh, I, I said, well, I have a partner, business partner. He would need to be included. I said, what's his skills? Bring him on out, you know, because they couldn't find models. Believe it or not, they couldn't find models. They even put ads in the newspaper and they got people that made uh, air, also with airplanes. Whereas, well, really, I was only hired for two weeks just to solve a particular problem on the desktop. And um, luckily for me, they had already started a number of uh, spaceships, like the TIE fighter and all that stuff. Well, here I had industrial design experience, with, which other people didn't. And that led to one secret that changed, changed my life. And that was, everybody knows what superglue is now. But in 1974-75, it was absolutely brand new. It's called the 910. And um, you could only buy it industrially. And since I was involved in industrial design, I had it. You know, it was really fast, much faster than super glue is now. You could put a dot of it down and move your finger eight inches and it would stop. You know, that, that was how fast it was. And uh, so about the third or fourth or fifth day, I was talking to my partner about all the things that they didn't know how to do. And what they were doing was they were doing uh, the princess's ship by mixing five minute epoxy, putting the plastic part on, and then putting a piece of masking tape on it, and then walking away and going to the next one and gluing with five minute epoxy. And then the epoxy would set off, they'd have to make some more, put the part on, masking tape, then go back, strip the masking tape off, on and on and on. So about the fourth or fifth day, I came in and I asked the seven model makers or actually six including me. And I said, everybody stop, stop what you're doing. And I put a I took a Nixon Ticonderoga pencil and stuck it cantilevered out on the table. Put my finger on it, put a drop of that stuff and then took my finger away and the pencil cantilevered off the table. And they were like, how did you do that? Why did you do it? Just instantaneously. And so it changed the, the way that we were making those models. If you can imagine the speed we can now make the models that change everything. And that kind of leads me into you know, having a little business on your own in which you, you, know, you would just spend hours and hours you know, until 2 o'clock in the morning to finish something. Your time wasn't as important as the money that you were spending on it. All of a sudden, I realized, after it took me a while to realize that what we were doing, time was a lot more important. You know, if you said that you could do something in one week as opposed to a month, but you had to spend $1,500, They'd say, well, where do we need to send the truck with the money, you know, and that kind of thing. And it, it took a while to dawn on me that uh, that, was, that was the situation with the film. It was so important that the film be finished in a year and a half. And the fact that I and my partner knew a ways to speed everything up in mean, mold making and materials. We, you know, in our heads, we already know, you know, you need to use snow, you need to do this, you do that. So anyway, the two weeks passed. And it became two months, it became two years, it became 20 years, it became almost four years at that time. So we, uh, it, it's a real, um, never look back. No one ever, I, I, I mean, it was a very brief.
reason I haven't finished Star Wars. I thought maybe I'd need to go look for another job, uh, but uh, it never happened. So I, I never had a, a resume. Uh, I don't even, I think in the late 60s I had one, but I never used, I never asked anybody for a job to lend by mine. So anyway, what I'm going to do is when I show the, the wow reel, and like I said, I was the chief model maker of various supervisors, but I, I never wanted to have my own little office. I always loved making models and everything. So even though we went from seven model makers to say 15 model makers to 30 model makers, to by the time we did SIS, it was 102 model makers. Uh, I personally didn't want to just become an administrator. I absolutely uh, loved what, what I was doing. You know. And so what I've done is put together what I call a wow reel, and it's the footage of some of those 60 films, although certainly not 60 films, that just emphasize modeling. And uh, it'll take me, uh, I'm not as fast as Ben is here, but uh, here we go.
Cowboys and um, uh, the, uh, the astronaut is a CG person, everything else is modeled, but they took Clint Eastwood's face and uh, pasted it onto a, uh, a mannequin so it looked like a Clint Eastwood. <laughs>
is a film called Pearl Harbor. smoke for water. A number of times we made miniature forests uh, use a lot of jumping nitrous. Unfortunately, the 
father said, you know, with the kids, his context is everything. So I started taking him to Indian movies, reading Indian books, and then six months later or so, sprang on him and hey, how about Indian <laughs> So, let's see, why? Mediocre 
films have good effects in them. <laughs> and uh, I was asked to, uh, since I could sculpt this kind of naturalistic rock and everything, I was asked to do this, even though I was working in another film. It was like, could you come over for a month and, and uh, carve and head up this uh, shop? Um, this is what it looks like from further away. And it actually had to have elevators underneath because the pile of debris was too high. Uh, and you can see here, earlier here, it's actually composed of all, we first made it as a big tower and then we cut it into sections. And inside of each section, there had to be a, a system so the rocks wouldn't bounce. No one ever tells you you gotta make the thing collapse without bouncing. But we all knew that from old fashioned films, old cowboy films and things like that, uh, Ozoro and uh, Flash Gordon, that sometimes they'd have a hero hit with a rock and it would bounce, you know. And you just immediately know that something was wrong there. So I remember that uh, beanbags for a kid, kids' toys don't bounce. And so from that, I came up with the idea of having jars with lead shot with motor oil on the inside of them. So a big rock had a big plastic jar with lead shot with uh, oil in it, and a little rock had a small one that was hidden in a drill. And uh, so it went up in there, so you could take a rock and throw it like that, it would just hit like a beanbag. And that, you know, if I'd not done it correctly, of course everybody would have complained, but no one clapped when it worked perfectly. <laughs> uh, well, uh, many times the case that you were hired to do the job uh, and make it work, and if you have a history of not having the shots make it work, you, you don't make it anymore. <laughs> So anyway, it had other like rams underneath of it, and all kinds of stuff happened underneath. Now this is uh, in the movie theaters when they show this at the various times. It always got incredible claps, you know, of, of the, uh, the crash for *A Men in Black*. Uh, and we did this many, many times. Um, you wouldn't know it, but usually the obligation of the model shop is to do three takes, and uh, you, you provide enough materials, you provide enough time, and everything. And in this particular case, it came out so neat, and everybody on the stage liked doing it that actually in one day we did 11 takes and uh, finished it about uh, somewhere around 12 o'clock. And I was, uh, I was ready to faint by that time. I, I fell back into a, a box of uh, sand and bags, and, uh, and they said, you know, maybe you should go home. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, you can barely see it, but there's a trough in here in which this ship travels on a rod, a very aluminum rod, and there's a guy underneath that drives it. He can drive it up and down and move it, and it travels through this faux earth. And it, it, it sounds easy to say faux earth, but one of the problems is, is that everybody thinks that an airplane, say, would hit the ground and make this deep, deep hole. And that isn't the way it works. In reality, uh, the Earth is incredibly dense, and an airplane might make a, a bit of a groove, but it's not going to dig it like a 20, 30 foot hole. But an audience emotionally wants something different than reality in that particular case. You, you need to see, you know, action and, you know, stuff that really wouldn't be happening. So it meant composing an Earth that was made of a lot of vermiculite, uh, dried peat moss, fuller's earth, and I made up a formula. Uh, that would, uh, the ship would be able to plow through. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like underneath. There is a guy under there, there with a video uh, feed and he has controls and he can make it go uh, up and down and then it's pulled by a hydraulic ram and accelerates incredibly fast. He has a big plastic shield so he won't be hurt and uh, that ship comes plowing down through the, uh, towards the camera. Uh, this is that uh, film Alive. And uh, it, it, Alive may have been around when uh, the majority of weren't even born yet, but uh, it involved a, a plane that crashed into the Andes. And uh, in reality, it crashed into large pieces of coal uh, with baking soda on a stick <laughs> uh, But that's what the, the, the stuff in the foreground is coal mounted onto a steel framework with baking soda. The mid-ground is a very thick aluminum foil that's about 12 to 15 times as thick as what you use at home. It was all, we made giant sheets of it and crink had people stand around it and crinkle it all together and then open it back up again, paint it black and then throw baking soda on it. 
So uh, that was just Tim Lucio. And way, way in the upper right hand corner is actually a large painting. This is kind of what it looks like with all the different rings in the face to shoot in it. Now, this was for, for Phantom Menace. I'm going to check my time here. For Phantom Menace, uh, George Lucas wanted C3PO to be built by Anakin, he didn't want it to be completed by Anakin. And so he proposed that it be transparent. In fact, he did have a silver suit on. So that presented a problem for Anthony Daniels, of course, because he wouldn't be able to fit into uh, uh, a wire suit like that. So there's a system of Japanese puppets called Bunraku, and they're half size puppets, and they use what's called shadow men behind them to operate them. And so we theorized this guy, Mike, he said, ah, okay, I'll, I'll pursue that part of the project. And he made this vest and tied into his helmet and everything and then walked around. Again, it was one of those proof of concept things. If you show the director and he goes, goes like this or he goes like that, and you proceed with it. And this one was a was a thumbs up, you know. And so that's more what it looked like with the guy in the green suit uh, operating him behind it. And I think uh, many times they had Anthony Daniels in the green suit actually operating because he, he had that, that way of, of moving that, that was hard for other people to reproduce. Now this is the, uh, the drawing from uh, the Padres of what we start out with, and then sometimes we make a maquette of what will eventually be made into a large model, and then we make it into a large model. It was a very, a very beautiful set. It had a, you know, you had to be able to come up from underneath so you could get low enough so you could be down at, as a human level. Now this is, again, you make up little prototypes of what the set's going to be. And uh, this is that carving that I said was uh, one of the more recent carvings that I, uh, I was the chief sculptor on this thing. And uh, it was uh, it really a joy to, uh, to work on. And what I would do is we would carve all day long. And then when everybody took off, I had a sandblaster that had ground up walnut shells in it rather than, uh, rather than sand. And I would shoot up from underneath, up here, 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 there. And it gave it that stalactite, stalagmite look. And then they would come back in the morning with knives and car, 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 and then I would take the edges off of the carving by shooting only upward with uh, walnut shells. That's what uh, looks up high. Those little things down the middle are, are dead Jedi, I think. Uh, again, a, a concept painting. Uh, um, that's one of the ways that really this kind of shows start out with is concept paintings like this are done, and George Lucas looks at them. Uh, says yes or no, but uh, that's what, how we conceive of it. Maquettes are made, very large sets are made, whoops. And uh, methicil, kind of a food additive, is used for a lava with very broad, bright lights underneath. And uh, excuse me if I'm talking fast because I realize that I uh, have a lot of stuff and want to ask some questions too. Uh, again, the coal with baking soda, that was an airplane, a uh, small airplane. And again, that aluminum foil, the real thick aluminum foil over top of styrofoam. Now, uh, here was a problem, too, is that if the plane, a very light plane, I mean, you can just lift it with one hand, if it were to actually hit the snow, uh, it would probably jiggle on its wires. So a uh, system had to be invented uh, to, to solve that problem. And what it is, is there's a very low level, low inflation rate balloon with a bungee cord that pulls it down and a needle that you can't see on the tip of the wheel of the airplane. And so that needle pierces the snow just before the wheel hits, and the balloon goes, oh, just a little bit. The air gets sucked down, and the balloon gets sucked, but the, the snow up above also is aerated, and the wheel can go right through to the snow and get a little pop. Again, not that anybody uh, says that's how you do it. You anticipate what could go wrong. Uh, this is the mine chase uh, you saw earlier, and it was done in stop motion, one frame at a time. The guy stepped in and manipulated these little characters. And one of the guys invented a, a camera with us, an icon camera with a big magazine, and it's pulled along. You can't see a little cable between the tracks, but it's uh, there's a capstan at either end that pulls the thing down and it can tilt and move. Again, that thick aluminum foil. And this is a, a proof that we did have women model makers. Um, I have to say for about the first uh, 
let's see, for the first four years or so, there weren't any, there were, the only women that worked at ILAN worked in the front office. And I had a meeting one time with the model makers and said, you know, uh, what, what do you don't like, what do you do like, what do you want more of, what do you want less of, uh, what's happening at work, do you not like the chairs, do you like, tell me anything that you don't like. And one of the guys, he jumped up and he said, sick and tired of working without any women. You know, a year, a couple of years, you know, we're working like 11, 12 hours a day. And uh, as soon as the new secretary spells up, she's, she's got date opportunities, you know, from people rushing up to the front. And uh, so uh, I went on the pursuit of finding uh, female model makers. And it was the first uh, woman other than the accounting for front office. And, uh, and, and one led to another, led to another, led to another, led to another. This is also Indiana Jones. And uh, this tunnel that we built eventually got so tight that only the, the women model makers that were around 100 pounds could have uh, made it through the tunnel. And uh, this is what the, the water came flying down. We had a, a water tank that held about the same weight as a Volkswagen, uh, but like a big hot tub that had a trap door that the water would fly down. So everything that was inside of it had to be attached really well. But if you see it in footage, there's a, a 50 gallon drum that comes flying out towards the camera at really at the right time. I had uh, I, I talked to uh, the producer on that show, uh, and uh, when he was there, he was looking in front of it, marveling at the thing. And I said, uh, You know, we have uh, uh, miniature mice in, uh, in, cockro miniature, in cockroaches with miniature mice outfits in a little cage ready to go when the water comes over. <laughs> and, and he said, he said, oh, that sounds just a little too much, I think. You know? <laughs> and I think I didn't really have the uh, little mouse on the but it, uh, it was a good touch. Uh, we, uh, we tried a number of ways to make the ghosts, and ultimately, rather than using the wind and silk, uh, one of the guys, we had the big water tanks, and he got a little rod, and he took a a silk ghost and put it in a water tank, and it had that really flowy kind of thing. You just pick the camera speed if you wanted. And uh, we're reaching the end here, or the slides that I have, but uh, this is Toad, and he is made out of layers and layers of different colored gelatin. You know, first into the mold with skin gelatin, and then a viscera gelatin, and then veins, and all this stuff. And then heat guns were placed on him, and I think he. He melted over a period of time, about 40 minutes or something like that. So he had a skeleton underneath. Oh. And uh, this isn't really supposed to be there, but it just shows the different scales that we would make. There was a live action uh, land skater, then uh, the semi, the medium scale, and then the small scale. And so sometimes the reason they're done things like that is we had this bigger scale, the little boy is next, and they said, uh, you know, we're using that stage, and we have to do that shot. We have to, have to make a, a faraway shot. We have to do the whole stage. How about we don't use that stage? You just make a little miniature one of a miniature, and then we can shoot it on a little stage that's you know, 10 foot by 10 foot. And it's worth it to have us make another model than it is for them to use up all that real estate. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that. And uh, we have some questions. Outside vendors, kind of thing, or yeah. was that? 
the oh, the drones. Uh, well, you know, it, it depends upon uh, what it, what directors want. You know, there, there was for a while there was a lot of films that had trains in it, and then there were films that had planes in it, and then ships that you know had ships in it. Like there'd be one very successful ship movie that had met models in it, and so on. Other directors went, God, that's the trick, you know. And so we'll do uh, Perfect Storm. We'll do like uh, you know that kind of a thing. So. Uh, it, it, it possibly would use drones. Uh, an interesting one is when I sh we showed the, uh, uh, for a lot, the very large airplanes that had 20 foot wingspans. We, one of the guys were going to be proposing using chainsaw motors for the, and they could actually fly. They were giant radio control models, but they had to fly through the clouds. And there was a problem there that the people who drove them knew that they could actually kill somebody if it ran into them. And so once it disappeared into the clouds, they had to nosedive the plane immediately. So we had multiple planes, and that news was too outrageously expensive. So after we crashed two or three airplanes, then they did them on wires uh, and the smoke machines. But right, the drones uh, might be a possibility. Um, there are people that make incredible air airplanes that fly, you know, huge airplanes. But, uh, but then um, you want to crash them, you have to have multiples, and they get emotional. Uh, can you just explain your basic process when you decide on scale you can build a model and if you have if you made a bad decision in the past, what happened after you created the model and it wasn't the right size? It wasn't the right size. Uh, well, you know, many times what we would do is we would make foam core models, the white cardboard model, or else even just tape it out on the ground to show the director, to show the special effects director. Say, well, what do you want? Do you want a six foot? Do you want a 12 foot? Do you want a eight inches? And we know that when you look at the storyboards, you can tell how far away is that model from the camera. You know, that, that's partly the purpose. It's really far away, uh, and it's only going to be used in one shot. You know, it, it can't be a very expensive model. And I, about expenses of models, uh, I. You know, 40 years is a long time to talk about how much money something costs. But if you think of it in used, used in new cars and Ferraris. So, you know, when we would make the big white, the white starter shirt in the first, that was more like a, a good BMW, you know. And then uh, by the time you would do a, like a lava planet, that's like a couple of Ferraris. You know, that kind of, that's the kind of cost of how much those things cost. So, you know, I, I think, it's an interesting story with my, my mother. My parents never really could quite figure out what I could do, did for a living, <laughs> even though I explained it to them and showed pictures. But I, they knew that I, you know, bought a house and had a car. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but my mother would ask the same kind of questions over again until I realized she didn't really know. And one time she cut to the chase and she says, well, Warren, because okay, I was working on budgets. And she said, Warren, what are we really talking about, you know, budgets? And I said, well, my budget this year is 1.5 million. And she just fell silent, you know. <laughs> and, and she had no idea that what I, the little things I made, and I knew that the first thing she wanted to do was to go to a neighbor's house and tell them before they have a conversation about <laughs> <laughs> his budget for next year. <laughs> but um, and I'm not sure if I answered all of your questions. Uh, usually, it, we nev you never get to this a stage uh, and everything goes wrong. I mean, it just it, it can't happen. There's too many. It's like there's half the size of this room is depending on getting paid salaries, and they're dependent upon the fact that you're delivering what's such and such at three o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. And if all of a sudden everything goes wrong, count up the salaries of all those people because they don't necessarily have something to go on to. So they, you know, the production people just go, oh my God, you know, that was, that's awful. That's like $40,000 down the tube because of him. Yeah. Right? So it just doesn't happen. Let's get this fresh one. You know, you 
almost can't count them. There are so many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, I'm, I'm sure even thousands, you know, of things. Because uh, there'd be multiple explosions of pie fighters, multiple explosions of planets, uh, um, explosions. I have all ten fingers, but the explosions were a big part of what you do, what I did, you know. And the, uh, Ben back there, we were talking the other day, and he said, yeah, you know, we made popcorn movies. Uh, you know, we didn't make it. Uh, nobody with a, a beret and a black turtleneck was in any movie <laughs> that we ever made. And, uh, but, you know, um, I, I would say that um, art, there's, there's art with a capital A. You've got your Sistine Chapel, you've got your Michelangelo, and there's art with a really miniature lowercase a part, and that's like uh, uh, paintings that your grandmother does, you know. And there's, a, there's everything in between. And, um, you know, I, you know, if I was, when I was growing up, if I thought, well, if I could have been Michelangelo again, or that would have been great with me, you know, but that, you know, I, I mean, somewhere between capital A or lowercase <laughs> art. Was there, was there um, all these demo guys there, or was it you guys just blowing uh, No, it could be all specialty people yeah. that do the demo. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, sometimes it, it sounds like I did this, I did that, I did this. In reality, you know, it's like I showed you the picture of the hundred, not quite a hundred people that did the first Star Wars. Well, imagine 2,500 people that did Jedi. And 600 of those, about 600 of those were um, uh, CGI people. Now, and I'm only talking about ILM. Uh, uh, ben eventually worked up at the ranch, and you know, there's a whole bunch of the people that work there, a whole bunch of people that do live action. You know, when you see the credits, you're just like, oh my god. And it, I always thought it was interesting if you just count those up and figure out a, just a general salary. You know, come up with a salary, come up with what their insurance is, uh, you know, health benefits, all that stuff, and then multiply that times the number of people you see. And I don't mean to come up with an outrageous salary, just come up with some, you know, general salary for people. It's just an incredible amount of money that gets spent, especially when you have a show like Jedi that just has roll after roll of people. And uh, this is going to seem very weird, but with the advent of CGI and how prevalent it is now, are you finding model work is becoming less and less? Because when we go to the cinema, we all go, when we see something in CGI and we see something that's being made through a model, the model always looks better in my mind. Yeah. But if you look at the first Star Wars and the attack on the Death Star, it looks real. Whereas you then look at it in episode one, two, or three, and you're like, well, that's very big. That's how it looks. So are you yeah. finding there's less model work now? Or is well, there still uh, there? George Lucas always had more model work, you know, is that going from seven to uh, 102 model makers. But, Definitely, uh, model making kind of, for me, 75, you know, one like this, like that, like that, and then, and then when I thought that Jurassic Park with the, with the coffin nail in model making, it kind of went like that, and back up, and back up again, and then it went like that, and peaked over and I retired. But, um, <laughs> there are, um, there are more model makers in the world for film now than there were when I started. You know, there are, but there aren't. Um, but it isn't like uh, if somebody said, "What career should I go into?" Um, there's probably enough model makers in the world right now. Uh, although there's probably room for another one, just like industrial design. That's a, a, a one of the guys that I worked with. He, we were in, both involved in industrial design, and he was so happy that his son went into industrial design. You know, graduated from school, he's traveling to China to. Uh, talk about manufacturing and things or design. So the guy has his chest is just monstrous because his son is doing what he would originally plan on doing. You know, so um, there's always there's always hope. Other <laughs> questions? Some hands over here. Anybody? <laughs> It feels of late like there's been kind of a renaissance of people wanting to do practical work. Oh, uh, Mad Max Fury Road, it's all real cars, mostly like, oh, Force Awakens, it's puppets and things. I'm curious as to your opinion why you think that is, why there's been what feels like kind of movement back to that kind of Well, I, I, let's, let's be a little bit cynical here first, and that is that having worked that long on films, you realize that free publicity is absolutely everything. And you remember how many times they said they were going to make another Indiana Jones before they actually made one? 
Well, every time they would even make an inkling of a little publicity uh, leak, you know, as if a leak, and that bought them an incredible amount of time on radio and TV, you know, just the general public. And people would ask me, so are they really going to make another Indiana Jones? And I'd say, well, they haven't made a cent, not one cent has been spent, not an inch of movement has ever happened at ILM. And I, they have to come to us eventually, I assume. <laughs> and uh, so when they say things like that, even about, say, the last uh, Star Wars, you know, when it came out a little while ago, uh, a lot of the, if there were models, they tended to be made uh, with 3D printing, you know, from artwork and everything like that. And not so much, uh, you know, exacto knives and uh, super glue and things like that. But some of it is done, uh, there was, uh, you know, a lot of it done for uh, Lone Ranger, you know, big, big bridges that collapsed. And there still is work, and there's still what, the remnants of what used to be the island model shop still exists. There's a company called 3210. And um, work is done, and there's more people working than there were when I started out, you know. So, but I, I'm always wary when I hear those kind of things that, that you know, I know that they just, the publicity department generates those kind of things all the time, just like CG, CGI, CGI, you know, it was like, they would always put it on TV in the nightly news, just like they did models back in 77, 78, 79. You know, I heard all that time it would show up on TV and the news would be free. And you, you can't, you can't just pay, to, to have to pay for all that stuff with his millions and millions of dollars. That's why Donald Trump says outrageous things. Oh, it was a political thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, can we have a big round of applause? Uh, other than that, can keep enjoying Kenny Films. Go see some movies.